You can't smoke on a plane anymore, or really anywhere else in the 21st century, much less a spaceship, but Charlton Heston isn't one for following rules. His character of George Taylor is a misanthrope, a self-imposed exile from our modern times, lamenting the state of man as he and his crew are hurtled towards the stars. Does man that marvel of the universe, that glorious paradox who sent me to the stars, still make war against his brother? He's about to go down for a long sleep, and on the other end, arrive in the far reaches of space, leaving his earthly brethren millions of miles and perhaps thousands of years behind. His mission? To harness the physics of time dilation and colonize the stars. Little does he know, the journey will take him someplace shockingly new, yet eerily familiar. The crew's quest won't necessarily advance the aims of modern civilization, not in the way they think. Instead, what they find is not humanity's future, but its ultimate doom. Planet of the Apes not only enthralled a new generation of science fiction fans with its meticulous world building, high concept premise, and spectacular finale, it also set the standard for many more sci-fi and fantasy films to come, films which would begin to dominate the 1970s and 80s. It confronted the public with a series of powerful themes and ideas wrought during its conception, an ongoing dialogue of revisions by artists such as the author of the novel, Pierre Boulle, producer Arthur P. Jacobs, concept artist Mentor Hubner, writers Rod Serling and Michael Wilson, and the film's director, Franklin J. Schaffner. Together they would craft a narrative that touched on live wire topics such as nuclear war, space travel, race and class relations, as well as perennial topics of special interest to me in this video, which is how we craft and nurture the unifying narratives and mythologies of our own civilization. Hi guys, I'm George. Thanks so much for coming back to my film journal. Without further ado, let's talk about Planet of the Apes, 1968. Let's get started. A rude awakening for the crew as water blasts into the cabin upon landing. Not everyone made the trip unscathed. Yeah, and this shot scared the hell out of me as a kid. Not only are the hopes of propagating the species on a new planet dashed with the death of Lieutenant Stewart, but our three astronauts, Taylor, Landon, and Dodge, are now stranded in a seemingly unending wasteland. That is until they see signs of civilization, what look like scarecrows, looming ominously from the sheer cliffs. There is life. What sort, though, is yet to be discovered. The production spent seven of their precious 55 shooting days on the trek through the desert sequence. The film's director, Franklin J. Schaffner, felt it was important to establish a sense of environment, of desolation, of foreboding anticipation before the movie really began to unfold. Jacobs agreed citing the film King Kong as inspiration, and the long prelude before the sensation of Skull Island. And these scenes do lure you in, making you feel the desperate plight of our astronauts, especially after Landon plants the ceremonial flag, claiming what looks to us to be a barren, worthless rock, where our heroes will certainly meet a miserable end, in vain, for the United States. Taylor laughs maniacally, thinking they will die alone here, the flag evidence to an empty posterity of a failed experiment. In the opening scenes, Heston is a bit of a bastard, relentlessly mocking Landon, dumping on humanity. I can't help thinking somewhere in the universe there has to be something better than man. Little does he know he will get his wish before the film's end. After their weather-beaten trek across a desolate, seemingly unending plain, the weary crew stumble across a marvelous sight, water, foliage, and as they frolic at the base of a waterfall, signs of intelligent life leading to a colony of what looks to be primitive human beings in rags, scattered amongst the trees, and evidence of agriculture. Look on the bright side. This is the best they've got around here, and six months we'll be running this planet. Suddenly, the humanoids begin to scatter. The astronauts, without their clothes, blend in with the pathetic sight of people fleeing the startling image of clothed apes on horseback. This casual and kinetic reveal of the apes is still startling, visually gripping, and shocks today. Apes with leather military garb. Apes with guns. Apes who have obviously perfected a method and routine for violently corralling human beings. Apes who hang dead humans from a trophy rack and take grinning photographs with their defeated game. Apes who string humans up in nets, kill the astronaut Dodge, and shoot Taylor through the throat, rendering him speechless. In these lowly conditions, Without the trappings of his advanced world, Taylor doesn't stand out amongst the trembling, squalid humans. He blends right in for his caged journey back to Ape City. It seems he truly spoke too soon, for his wisecrack about running the planet 
will be the last line of dialogue spoken by Heston for 30 minutes of the film's runtime. Ape City, a marvelous rendering of a sort of pastoral and primitive society populated by three distinct classes of bipedal, clothed, talking apes. Orangutans, the religious and social clerics, chimps, the scientists and middle managers, and gorillas, the warlike military arm of the strange government. The film studio, 20th Century Fox, and its embattled CEO, Richard Zanuck, cut the shooting days from 66 to 55, and the budget mere weeks before shooting, which led the production to make drastic aesthetic deviations from the novel, changes that ultimately benefited the series. In Boulle's story, our hero, the French astronaut Ulysse Moreau, arrives on the planet of Soror, in which apes rule, but in more of a mirror image of our own society. There are cars, airplanes, skyscrapers, and apes dressed in suits and ties. Whereas Schaffner's inclination to accommodate the budget was to portray an ape civilization in its own sort of medieval period. But the closest approximation to Boole's future concept we would get in this series is when Zira and Cornelius return to our present day and escape from the Planet of the Apes in 1971 and try on our human wares. In the script's initial drafts, written by legendary Twilight Zone creator Rod Serling, the futuristic ape city was preserved. When screenwriter Michael Wilson was hired to do a rewrite with the directive to cut the budget, he suggested art director William Kreber and artist mentor Hubner take a look at 19th century Catalan architect Antony Gaudi, an artist who had created rather remarkable and unusual buildings in Europe. Kreber noted that the influence of Gaudi's work lent a certain arboreal quality to the ape city, which made sense considering the apes might have plausibly modeled their city on trees or cave dwellings from which they emerged. The architect Gaudi, coincidentally, was a very religious man, creating many cathedrals for the Catholic Church, which earned him the nickname God's Architect, the religious influence being something very important to ape society as well, as Taylor will begin to discover in his Kafkaesque struggle against the ape hierarchy as he wakes up on an operating table under the knife of two talking chimpanzees. Heston has found himself in an upside-down world, struggling to speak, to prove his intelligence, but he finds himself temporarily mute due to his wound. Dr. Zira, a friendly chimpanzee scientist, notes from the outset that he is special, she even gives him a cute nickname. What's so special about him? What? Hello, bright eyes. How's our throat today? Frustratingly, every attempt to prove his intelligence is either perceived as hostile by the apes or proves futile against the rigid notions of Dr. Zayas, who seems determined not to find interest in Taylor. There. Can you believe it? Yes, amusing. A man acting like an ape. Heston is remarkable here, and you really feel his plight, totally deflated, despite his best efforts. You can see the frustration in his inability to prove his worth, to be confronted with real prejudice against him, something that this handsome astronaut might not have ever encountered back home, but something that was on the minds of every American during the turbulent times amidst the film's release, which was bookended by both the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. In his book, Planet of the Apes as American Myth, Author Eric Green delivers a rather succinct summary of a certain interpretation of Planet of the Apes. In the Apes series, racial conflict is removed from the audience's present, projected in the near and distant future, and reinscribed as species conflict, i.e. the apes' mistreatment and marginalization of human beings can be easily read as an allegory for the mistreatment of black Americans by whites. In my opinion, we're a little overloaded right now with reevaluations of popular works interpreted through a racial lens. And for my part, I find some of this scholarship rather tiresome and repetitive. However, if we're talking about a film like Planet of the Apes, a film placed firmly in the context of the civil rights movement of the 60s, I think it's warranted, especially with what we know about the creative team behind the film. Rod Serling, who stated, The singular evil of our time is prejudice. It is from this evil that all other evils grow and multiply. In almost everything I have written, there is a thread of this, man's seemingly palpable need to dislike someone other than himself. And though Charlton Heston is mostly remembered today as an advocate for Ronald Reagan and a staunch gun rights activist, he was, at the time, also a very vocal supporter of the civil rights movement. And director Franklin Schaffner had a certain political pedigree as a filmmaker, having directed the Gore Vidal penned political drama The Best Man in 1964 and the television film A Tour of the White House with Mrs. John F. Kennedy which showcased the efforts of Jackie Kennedy's $2 million restoration of the White House. The show was such a success that Schaffner was asked to consult with President Kennedy on his televised speeches and appearances, given Schaffner's expertise in the medium. Schaffner admitted of Apes that it was more or less a political film, with science fiction last. 
Still, even with portions of its creative team actively mining meaning from the premise of Apes, some, like its dogged producers Arthur Jacobs and Mort Abrams, were reportedly surprised and taken aback when singer Sammy Davis Jr. approached them at a restaurant and called Planet of the Apes the greatest statement on black and white relations he had ever seen on film. All this is to say that Planet of the Apes can be enjoyed as a simple thriller action science fiction adventure, but if you're here watching this video, I imagine you'd like to dig further. In order to prove his humanity to a society bent on ignoring it, Heston has some of his best scenes alongside Kim Hunter and Roddy McDowell, Azira and Cornelius, two sympathetic chimpanzees willing to at least entertain a flaw in the unifying ideology of ape supremacy. Heston, voiceless, communicating with written notes, makes his case. Where did you learn to do this? Jefferson Public School. Scenes like these, scenes which mine the material for irony and topical satire, were honed in subsequent drafts by writer Michael Wilson. Wilson had suffered until recently under the Hollywood blacklist regime, a former Marxist who became disillusioned with the Soviet Union after their violent reaction to the Hungarian Revolution in 1956. Wilson had experience with Pierre Boulle's work, having penned the screenplay adaption of Boulle's novel The Bridge Over the River Kwai. According to Serling, mine was much more somber and serious. There was very little humor in my piece. If you recall, Wilson used a lot of puns and juxtaposed familiar expressions. I gather the humor was one of the key reasons for the success of the picture. I blew it, and Wilson did it. Wilson, while not changing the plot or structure of the film, managed to mine from the idea something along the lines of a swifty and satire, like Gulliver's Travels, a stranger in a strange land, the customs of its strange inhabitants, a mirror into our own society. Well, if you were a missing link, the sacred scrolls wouldn't be worth their parchment. Well, maybe they're not. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. <laughs> I'm not going to get into that battle. <laughs> the scene is very well staged, engaging and ultimately the moment in the movie that proves the ape makeup could work in a dramatic situation. And you could begin to see the apes really as characters. The makeup effects are really incredibly special, and that Hunter and McDowell were able to demonstrate such a range of emotion and character ticks through all the prosthetic and latex is nothing short of astounding. You can't talk about Planet of the Apes without mentioning the incredible makeup industrial complex marshaled into being by John Chambers and his dedicated team. Chambers was a difficult man, an exacting man who honed his makeup craft by making prosthetics for disfigured GIs during World War II. By all accounts, an arduous ordeal for the actors, forced to rise at four in the morning and undergo the complex process. Nowadays, I think actors are more game to undergo drastic transformations and take risks with their appearance, because for one, it's great for the press tour, and two, it lends a certain air of hardship and commitment to the otherwise rather lofty profession of acting. But then, this was new territory. Edwin G. Robinson was originally cast as Dr. Zayas and even appeared in test footage shot on the Fox backlot to prove the effect could work, but when it came time to sign the contract for the movie, he demurred, not willing to suffer the demands of the makeup chair. I can imagine the panic from both Roddy McDowell and Kim Hunter's agents, knowing their clients' faces would be obscured by ape makeup. It must have seemed absurd. Kim Hunter, while not a huge star, appeared in great films like Powell and Pressburger's A Matter of Life and Death and Elia Kazan's film and original Broadway run of A Streetcar Named Desire. And now she's going to be playing a monkey? The casting of McDowell, Hunter, and Maurice Evans as Zayas was really a prescient choice, as the makeup would not work half as well without their performance bringing it to life. McDowell became quite an old hand at puppeteering his prosthetics as he would develop many rules of thumb during his long tenure with the franchise, appearing in four of the films as well as the television series. The makeup was quite an arduous burden to bear for many of the actors, requiring constant touch-ups on location shoots. The delicate appliances did not withstand chewing very well, so all the apes had to drink their liquid meals through a straw. All worth it in the end, however, as the ape makeup, the way it communicates the gorilla while still allowing a range of motion and expression from the human performer, is a wonderful artistic hybrid, not, surprisingly, horrific or hard on the eyes. It's its own special comic design, as impactful as the design of E.T. or Geiger's Alien, much more of an iconic pop production, hybridization, approximation of upright humanoid apes, rather than simply CGI that converts actors into photorealistic monkeys. I've not seen all those new apes movies. By all accounts, they're rather good. But this type of design is much more my speed. Not fell, flew. Fly 
flight is a scientific impossibility. And even if it weren't, why fly? Where would it get you? Immediately dashed by the dogmatic Dr. Zayas, who crushes the paper airplane out of spite. What is this? The first moment in which we begin to suspect that Zayas isn't simply prejudiced against humans, but perhaps has ulterior motives to his lack of curiosity. Perhaps he has something to hide, as Taylor is violently dragged away. Apes, as American myth author Eric Green noted the extra power given to the race allegory via the inclusion of Heston, an actor often cast as pillars of Western civilization in historical epics, whether it be fighting off Muslim attacks against Christendom in El Cid or defending a Western compound against a Chinese rebellion in 55 Days at Peking, Heston had continually occupied the role of white man against various other races, on the screen and perhaps in the public consciousness, which makes his brutal subjugation by the apes, often visually reminiscent of the matter associated with African chattel slavery, all the more shocking and effective. Heston being violently doused with water also brings to mind widely seen footage of peaceful civil rights demonstrators punished by fire hoses on southern streets in the 1960s. Heston noted in his diary during shooting, It occurs to me that there's hardly a scene in this bloody film in which I've not been dragged, choked, netted, chased, doused, whipped, poked, shot, gagged, stoned, leaped on, or generally mistreated. It's a madhouse! A madhouse! Taylor, the peculiar phenomenon, is brought to trial. A sham proceeding, presided over by the orangutan overlords, who clearly have the final say in his fate. Taylor's trial is maybe the most straightforward moment of satire, the ire of which is directed at America's then hegemonic Christian majority. That the Almighty created the ape in his own image, that he gave him a soul and a mind, that he set him apart from the beasts of the jungle and made him the lord of the planet. Referencing other high-profile legal battles, like the Scopes Monkey Trial which sought to persecute a Tennessee school teacher for teaching Darwinism. The trial had been adapted to the screen in Stanley Kramer's popular drama Inherit the Wind in 1960. This joke suggests that the orangutan masters are basically a conservative caricature from a left perspective. It becomes obvious when after the trial in Zayas' office that the old ape leader fears the truth, fears human usurpation of ape society. He can't allow there to be a crack in the grand unifying narrative of the ape. And therefore, Taylor is set to be killed. But you do it out of fear. Remember that. Remember that. Because you're afraid of me. What are you afraid of, Doctor? Taylor evades his impending castration and execution with help from Zira and Cornelius, bringing along the beautiful mute cave woman Nova as they venture into the Forbidden Zone, a portion of the map cordoned off from interaction, foretold to be uninhabitable. The fleeing group is headed off by Zaius and his guerrilla soldiers. And on the coast at the edge of the map, they are confronted with prehistoric evidence of human intelligence. Dr. Zayas, would an ape make a human doll that talks? Which forces Zayas to admit the truth, that humanity destroyed itself. Everything he has done has been in service of a noble lie to keep humanity in bondage in order to suppress its destructive tendencies. The Forbidden Zone was once a paradise. Your breed made a desert of it ages ago. This revelation, in my opinion, makes Zaius a more sympathetic character. I mean, whether or not you want to include Beneath the Planet of the Apes in the formulation of the first film is up to you. But in the sequel, Zaius is basically proven right when Taylor ultimately blows up the Earth, uh, basically out of spite fulfilling Zaius' prophecy of man as a destructive animal. And therefore, ultimately, Zira and Cornelius' meddling did bring about the destruction of ape society that Zaius warned against. It's a question of simian survival. The impetus to safeguard and preserve historical narratives are natural, arguably important to the preservation of any society, because the power of narrative has an incredible ability to unite. Is it, for instance, wise? to dwell upon or negate the powerful influence of the founders of the United States by focusing on their culpability in the slave trade? Is it productive to tear down their statues, disgrace their legacy? I think by doing this, we risk poisoning the collective imagination of the country, undermining our story. 
We can tear down our sacred cows in the name of truth. But if we do this, what are we left with? Who will replace these men in the grand unifying narrative of the country? And this goes for what seems to be the reality of evolution as well. Psychologically, how does it affect a population to know that they are descended from apes rather than children of God? Paradoxically, though, the impulse to mask the truth can lead to the very outcome you sought to negate, as articulated very well by Dr. Hasline, who occupies the Zeus role in Escape from the Planet of the Apes, but this time a human, faced with a mirror situation of the first film, in which apes, Zira and Cornelius, harboring the possibility of human devastation, arrive in our time. How many futures are there? Which future has God, if there is a God, chosen for man's destiny? If I urge the destruction of these two apes, am I defying God's will or obeying it? Am I his enemy or his instrument? Zeus and Haslin's impulses are very human ones. Still, had they both been less reactionary and more welcoming to the other, this doomed fate might not have been precipitated. This is much more explicit in Caesar's ape uprising in conquest of the Planet of the Apes, the climax of which, according to director J. Lee Thompson, was modeled on the Watts riots in black neighborhoods in 1965. All of this destruction wrought by Caesar and his apes would not have come to fruition had apes not been mistreated and enslaved by the humans. Caesar! Your servant. Your creature. And ultimately, we see Caesar by film's end on his way to becoming just as tyrannical as the humans via his final speech. And we shall build our own cities in which there will be no place for humans except to serve our ends. And we shall found our own armies, our own religion, our own dynasty. And that day is upon you now! Therefore, if there is a message that unifies the entire ape series, it's a plea for racial coexistence. Harmony, if possible. If not, we're all doomed. The finale in which it is revealed that we have been on Earth the entire time is a powerful twist and cemented the film's enduring legacy. We're led to believe that the apes were able to rise in the power vacuum created by man after having destroyed ourselves through nuclear conflict. To audiences of the time, it would have been obvious that this outcome was wrought by Soviet-NATO nuclear exchange, potentially sometime in the distant future. The idea of mutually assured destruction, just as topical and salient for audiences of the time as the race issue. The idea of humanity's scientific endeavors and warlike nature ultimately acting as its undoing was a contribution of Serling's. The idea of them being on Earth the entire time, a twist lifted from one of his Twilight Zone episodes. I shot an arrow in the air. We never left the Earth. We just... <laughs> we just crashed back into it. <laughs> this twist was another departure from Boole's novel. In the book, the astronauts land on the planet Sol, and only after the hero escapes and returns to Earth does he find that with the passage of time, apes have now come to rule it as well. Boole did not like the script's change, calling it somewhat hyperbolically a temptation from the devil. Boole was more interested thematically in the gradual decline of our society and in societal retrogression. And academics like Mark Graham have argued that Boole's book was a veiled ode to the idea of lost empire, a reaction to the abdication of France's colonies to those Boole might have seen as less than, like the Algerians. Rather than meeting a dramatic end through nuclear destruction, in Boole's version, humanity just slowly wastes away, loses its nerve, loses its thrust. His character of Professor Antel in the book loses his civility and regresses to animalism, while in ape captivity, but unlike Landon in the film, he is not forcibly lobotomized. He simply regresses naturally because of his circumstances. Boole, however, did come around to the film after reading the final script. I really don't know whether it is a masterpiece or simply a clever good job. I happen to think that you cineasts are right and that P. Boole was wrong. Only the public reaction can decide whether it is a brainwave. Take your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape! Well, the movie was a massive hit and a huge boon to the bottom line of Fox, who was struggling with the flop musical star and Dr. Doolittle at the time. Obviously, in my opinion, the film is a masterpiece, but I won't sell Bull's book short. It's very good, too. A fun read. I can't imagine the audience reaction at the time to seeing the Statue of Liberty in the sand, 
the former misanthrope Taylor, who accepted the expedition to escape humanity, now its sole representative, forced to walk the desolate earth alone, finally getting his wish as it turns to ashes in his mouth. I've taken this particular track in discussing this movie, and I hope, if anything, if you liked it, I didn't suck the fun out of the movie because that's really the draw of Planet of the Apes is how deftly they wrangle fun, adventure, action, excitement with topical and important thematic concerns. I mean, I remember seeing this film as a kid. It was incredible. I was just spellbound by it. And I think the interesting thing, too, about its sequels is that they're all fairly enjoyable. I think the worst is probably Beneath the Planet of the Apes, which is sort of a um, half-baked reboot sequel that only really becomes interesting in the final 30 minutes with the return of Charlton Heston, who balked at the idea of even returning. They had to pay him like a million bucks to show up for 20 minutes. I think he filmed for five days. Um, it's pretty interesting in terms of that's the film where they really focus on the idea of nuclear destruction. That's the concern of that movie. Escape is a really fun, well-made, interesting film. It really shows what you can do when the studio cuts your budget down. How could you possibly continue this series when you can only afford makeup for two apes and uh, the Earth has been just completely destroyed and obliterated in your previous movie. It really is a, a feat that they were able to wring a third film from this franchise. But that movie, I think, is really accessible, fun, and would play to a pretty large audience. Four and five, I think the film begins to retreat into itself and become very concerned with its own lore. Um, the fourth movie, I think, is fairly dynamic, exciting, and interesting and pretty astoundingly violent and aggressive for the time if you watch the uh, extended version. The fifth film, I think if you're going to stick with it that long, you might as well watch it. It's not as great, but there it does have its own certain charms. Um, the fascinating thing about the Planet of the Apes series, though, is how the dynamics of oppressor oppressed, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, uh, constantly is cycled through, where in the first one you have the humans are on the bottom rung, the apes are on top, same with the sequel. In the third one, it's reversed. Humans are on top, apes on the bottom. Fourth, similar, but by the movie's end, apes are on top again. And then in the fifth one, we have this weird alliance of the three ape classes, as well as some humans, against mutant humans, but the ape coalition begins to fray between gorillas, orangutans, chimps, and human beings. So it gets kind of like muddled and wild, and that's why I think it would be worth reading if you're that interested, Eric Green's book, um, Planet of the Apes is American Myth, which does a lot to sort of um, classify and organize all the ways in which the hierarchies flip and how then we can interpret that through the lens of race and class in America, right? So it's fairly interesting, but I have to also give it up to J.W. Rinsler's incredible, exhaustive making of book on the first film. Um, this is a guy who's done a lot of great work, sadly passed away a few years ago. He did uh, you know, four great books on Indiana Jones and Star Wars. And boy, if the likes and subscriptions and comments keep rolling in, maybe I'll be able to you know, devote my time to researching exhaustingly uh, the production of certain movies. I'm thinking a coffee table book on, on Krull, from 1983 would be a good place to start. But uh, if you guys like my work and um, you'd like to support it and continue, so I can continue making these videos, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Um, but other than that, the likes, comments, and subscriptions really help. I hope you guys appreciate this essay. I hope you like it. Um, but if you don't, let me know. Next uh, movie I'm going to do, The Long Goodbye, Robert Altman's adaption of the Raymond Chandler story. So I'll see you then, and you guys have a great week. Bye. I just also like to point out too that you know all the work I do for you guys. I even watched a fucking cartoon from the seventies. Um, you, you could it, take it or leave. It. It's okay. I, you know, I know Cine Crisis is going to probably rail me for this one because he probably he finds all sorts of greatness in it. But uh, I could barely make it through when I was sick in bed in a snowstorm. It's okay.